Some paintings we love for their grandeur. Some paintings we love for the sake of the artists who create them. Some paintings we love for the pivotal role they play in art history. Other paintings we simply love because they capture something so simple, so stunning, so apparent that once we've seen them, we can no longer imagine the world without them. Such a painting for me is Nat Little's Silver Sail. I'd like to start off with just a little bit of context for you about the artist. Nat Little was born in, in Montana in 1893 and instantly had some challenges to overcome in becoming an artist. He was from the West, still very distant from centers of privilege and wealth. He was an American and his young country was still emerging from the ravages of the Civil War, still had to prove itself on the international stage. Famously, the, Wal the critic Walter Armstrong wrote of American art as a wilderness, a desert of amateurish imbecility. For Nat and his peers, the solution was clear. It was the Academy. The Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts was the first such institution on American soil. Nat jumped on the Transcontinental Railroad and headed east, and he flourished at the Academy, eventually winning their top scholarship, enabling him to travel to Paris to study at the Académie Julien. It must have been breathtaking for a, young, um, for a young man from the ragged Western edge of the United States. He shared the experience with other Pennsylvania Academy students, Kenneth Bates and Gladys Edgerly, whom Kenneth would later marry, and Carl Lawless. Together they studied at the academy and increasingly they questioned the academy. Back in the United States, Nat Little decided to pursue more studies at the Art Students League in New York City when Kenneth and Gladys, now married, moved to Mystic where Kenneth was from and Carl Lawless went with them. It wasn't long before Nat decided that he could no longer resist the natural beauty of the setting, the proximity of, of like-minded artists and friends, and the freedom from the restrictions of the academy. He moved to Mystic and under the guidance of Charles Harold Davis, their mentor, the group helped found the Mystic Art Association as an alternative, a career alternative to the academy. It was a risky move at any time. In the face of the Great Depression, it could have been catastrophic. They were saved largely thanks to the Federal Art Project of Roosevelt's Works Progress Administration. In the long run, they did flourish, so did the Art Academy. And eventually, Nat Little did return to Montana where he died at the ripe old age of 78 in 1971. I believe that we, can, that we can see some of his experiences of change and self-determination reflected in this very lovely painting. What do we observe at the outset? Well, it's representational. It's intended to convey a very specific three-dimensional space. It's a maritime painting, a vessel offshore. It's at the cusp of the day, the sun is either going up or coming down. The horizon is very clear, at least it is now. We don't know what's coming with the turbulent air reflected in the sky, in the cloudscape. And what may not be immediately apparent to you is there's no foreground. This painting is all about that middle ground and the deep space of the background. Its colors are uniformly cool. They recede away from the viewer. They're beautifully modulated, but overall the palette is a soothing receding blue. The format, very nearly square. This isn't going anywhere. It's very stable. And overall the simplicity or the apparent simplicity of color, composition and format create a kind of resonance and stability and calm for the viewer. Now, what might we see if we could stop reading the image and just look at the composition? Well, there's a very easy way to find out and it can be just turning the painting upside down.
To me, the effect is startling when I first did this with this painting. The tone changes completely, but the groundedness does not. What do I mean by that? Well, the test of any representational painting is its sense of gravity. Do the masses hold together? When we turn this painting upside down, though it doesn't make literal sense, down is still down. The water is still the water. The masses hold together. Why, why do we feel that so consistently? Well, partly it's this beautiful, clear horizon, modulated, but straight and unbroken. We have also these reiterating tiny wavelets, these beautiful, I don't know if you can see them, these beautiful small lines that are interspersed with quiet highlights, almost like notes on a musical scale. The whole thing coheres, it holds together. What's so stunning about turning this upside down, what changes is its sense of agitation. We go from a quiet boat in the evening to this very agitated cloudscape. Why does that become more obvious to us now that we've turned it upside down? Well, because we're human beings. This occupies the space we would enter if we walked into the painting and we are sensitive to that. Lastly, when we turn it upside down, what we notice is this very beautifully, delicately painted lighthouse. This is not a bolt of light in the depths of night. This is a gentle pulsing light that does its job and no more. Let's turn it back around. I just, I can't stand how much I love this painting. I, I almost can't stand how much I love this painting. So small boat, big sky, coming of evening, change in the weather. Why isn't this cliche? How, what keeps this from falling into the cliche of a dramatic moment? Well, largely it's understatement. We've discussed how carefully modulated these blues are. They, they go from a warm blue to a cool blue, and even the highlights have blue tints. Even the warm colors in the sky in these negative spaces where the, where the warmth of the sun comes through, even those are, have, are modulated by tints of, of cool. What also, what also keeps this from being predictable though is that calamitous sky. It's the brush strokes are vivid, the, the shapes are irregular and abstract. And compared to these rhythmical musical lines in the water, they set up almost an auditory sensation, especially when you add in that tone, that, that note of the lighthouse, almost like a foghorn in the evening. To me, the whole thing is suggestive of a day that is receding into night and the lapping of waves against the hull of a boat. Maritime paintings are often violent. They depict, they depict great events, battles at sea. Maritime paintings depict the conflict of elemental forces as in the paintings of J.M.W. Turner. This painting is almost hypnotically quiet. To me, it conveys a receding, as we've discussed, conditioned by the deeps of the sea and the very human scale of the boat and the lighthouse. Because the lighthouse is so understated, it's a, it becomes for us a guide, not an endpoint. Because the only suggestion of great forces of nature are way up in the sky, we feel as though the overall sensation is that the boat is starting its journey. The water is calm, the sails are full. We see the landmarks that we need to guide by. It's almost as though Nat Little was saying, my craft can take whatever's coming. I don't expect to control the elements. I live among them and in their strength and plenitude, they are beautiful. Thank you.